ring here, and we're doing the sacrifice of Isaac. Remember, this is all part of what we started a few weeks ago called In the Beginning, which is the uh, development of the human mind. Uh, you're going you're to hear about Abraham, and you're going to hear about Isaac or Isaac, and you're going to hear about Sarah. And I think the thing to keep in mind is these people don't exist, never did exist. And they're not presented to you in any form whatsoever other than as a myth, which is very important for you, because they describe something extremely special and extremely important in uh, the way of consciousness. It's the development of the mind, and this is a very, very important part we've reached to here. So just forget about these as people and think of them as yourself, okay? It's you. And in here, where all this gray matter is, reside Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah. And their names given to describe different parts or concepts of the human mind in a way of thinking. Okay. Now, how do I know that? How do I know that there wasn't really these people going through all of this trivial? You know, I, it's very easy for me to come up here and say, well, that's my opinion. I really don't think that they existed. I, I can't do that because that, that's not being fair to you. I have to, in some way or other, be able to document to you the fact that this is a symbolic story. We always, we always kind of preface the things that I do with documenting the fact that this is a symbolic story. And so turn to page 953 in those little Bibles, page 953, and you'll read about the very story that we're talking of, okay? And if, if I believe that the documentation that you're about to see should give you and me both the authority to fly with this then and the knowledge that this is something very special. It has to do with something other than what is being described because it specifically states that that's the nature of this story. Page 953, Galatians chapter 4, and talking about in verse 22, Abraham had two sons, blah, 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 that's what we're talking today. Verse 24, the first sentence in verse 24, which things are in allegory. And an allegory is a symbolic story that has a deep hidden meaning. That's what this is all about. Okay? So you then have the authority to go into the Old Testament, you go into the entire Bible and look at the allegories, the parables, the proverbs, the, the, the symbolisms, the numerology, the cosmological inferences, and all of these things. And then you uncover a diagram for your life, a diagram for the development of your mind, how to use your mind, how to use your brain, how to use your body, because that's what this is about. In this particular story, we have Abraham as the patriarch as the mind. We have Sarah as that divine aspect of the feminine principle which gives birth. And of course we have this Isaac. Now if you want to look at this story literally, what you've got here is a man who's 100 years old, a woman who's 90 years old. And lo and behold, this heavenly benevolent God smiles down, if you want to call it that, and this woman has a baby at 90 years old. Imagine how, how uh, he's 100, she's 90, they have a kid. Now, that's, if that was the end of the story, that would be great. You know, if you want to take it literally, boy, that really sounds special. But the interesting thing is now this benevolent God who waited until she was 90, he was 100 for them to have their first child is going to tell them to kill it. Can you imagine this? Just imagine this if you can. Here's Abraham working around the house, he's working in the garage, doing whatever people did in those days, and God comes walking up the driveway. And Abraham sees God and says, Oh, where you are, God, whoa. Uh, I'm so happy, you made me so happy. Here I am, I'm a hundred years old. My wife is 90 years old. You give us a baby. And God says, yes, yeah, it's true. How, how's the kid? Oh, I'm so happy. I'm crying because you made me so happy. And Sarah, she, they were old. Sarah's so happy. God says, Abe, I need a favor. <laughs> you need anything you say, God. What you've done for me, I'm 100, she's 90, you give us a baby. You've done so much. Anything you say. Okay, yeah. Yeah, just a, a little favor, Abe. What do you want God to say the word? 
Because with God, all things are possible. You know, Lord, look at you. You're God. You know, I'm Abraham. She's on. We got a babe. What do you want? Abe, I want you to kill the kid. <laughs> Abe. Abe. <laughs> Abe. <laughs> Now Sarah comes walking out with the kid in her arms. Ah, goodbye, baby. What? Hey, God, you coming? <laughs> How's the kid, Sarah? Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you, God, for this. This is wonderful. What happened to Abe? Uh, I, I don't know, Sarah. I think they call it slain in the spirit. Every time they get near to me, these people pass out. I, I can't talk to anybody. As soon as they come up, they fall down. I, I haven't had a conversation in years. <laughs> and, and, and then Sarah says, well, did, did you come for the circumcision? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might say <laughs> circumcision. And here's the story. Abe's laying there outstretched. She ain't going to wake up. Sarah's got this little kid. He's 100, she's 90, and God says he wants you to kill the kid. He's 100, she's 90, they're barren. God wants you to kill the kid, and you're going to do it. And so Abe picks up a knife. This is the best part. Raises it up, is about to slit little Isaac's throat, and God yells out, Hey, never mind! <laughs> Whoa! What do you think of that, Amy? <laughs> I was only kidding! <laughs> Don't you take a joke? Now, this is the one we're following around. This is our Heavenly Father. <laughs> Can you imagine what kind of a character this is? So, this is the story we're dealing with. And if this, if you're going to take this literally, then we're dead. And, and but basically, that's what, that's, what, that's what we do. That's what we've been raised to do, you know? And what would you do? Let me ask you. You have a child. You might have a little daughter. You might have a little son, OK? I want to show you how much, how much of your faith you have. God comes and says, I want you to take your kid. I want you to take a knife. And tonight, I want you to kill it. Do that and you'll be in with me. How many of you would do it? I don't care about God. I said, God, you're perverted. You need to, we need to get a new God, get lost. We're going to get a new, we don't want to talk about such trash as that. So what we have then is if we have a God who allows a person 190 to have a baby and then says to kill the baby, and then when the father's in the act of killing it said, I was only kidding, you have a God whose should, name should be changed from God to the Marquis de Sade. He's sadistic. That's the only way you can describe it. Has anybody, have, 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 you, have you ever stopped to think about this story? Have anybody ever stopped when you're reading and you, you got the book in your hand and you're singing Amazing Grace or I Walk in a Garden of Blown? Have you ever stopped to think of such a bizarre tale as this, which is part of the fundamental aspect of your life? It's, if you, I did a little thing I sent to all of the newspapers and radio stations and also about the evil family, the evilness. It's, in the, it's on the shelf in the back. There. Have anybody ever stopped to think as you're all muddling, running around, trying to figure out what has happened to the traditional family. The traditional family was so wonderful. The traditional family is falling apart, and we're having all of this violence. It's because the traditional family is evil. And it's self-destructing. It's an evil concept. And the reason that a traditional family is an evil concept is because the religions of the world have predicated the foundation of the traditional family on the basis that one part of the population Namely, the female must submit and subject herself to the other part, namely the male. It's an evil concept. When you degrade one person to say, you must bow your knee and submit to another person, that's evil, which makes the family evil, and then you are programming the family to self-destruct, which evolution has taken care of, and it is. And so if we're going to return to that which is the, the traditional family, it has to be on the basis of co-partnership, or, or, or it will never come back again. But nobody ever stops to question these things. Nobody ever stops to talk about stories like this. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, look, it's an allegory. Look at page, uh, what page, do, go, go to page um, 16 in the Bible. And Genesis 22 is where we're, where we're talking about this. 
And this is what you have to understand. Don't tell me about sacrifice. You want to use the word sacrifice? You want to take this literally? You want to say, oh, this is what you were taught all of your life and all of your churches, that God said sacrifice this child. Don't talk about that. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. So God tempted Abraham to do what? To sacrifice Isaac? Forget about it. Here's the word. First degree premeditated murder. That's all it is. <laughs> the word sacrifice is a religious word. It has nothing to do with religion. It is first degree premeditated with malice of forethought murder. And so then, if we're going to take the Bible literally, that's what you have to deal with. And if I were you, I would then stop trying to get these books put into the, into the public schools, and I would certainly throw them out of my house. I wouldn't have any part of them, because we're following around a person who is not only sadistic and all kinds of uh, other words that you want to put into it, but also guilty of trying to get someone to murder somebody else for his benefit. There's no difference. So I said, who, you know, you, it's, you, know what, you know what Abraham turns out to be in this case? The hitman. Abraham's the hitman. I want to kill Isaac. I want you to do it. I'm not going to do it. You do it. Okay. Now, the glorious thing about this is it never happened, and that's not what it means. And that's the beautiful part. So when it says in Genesis 22, to take your only son, okay, take your only son, that means quite simply take the desires of your mind. That's what the sun is. The sun is the desires of the mind. That's what it means in metaphysics. Take the desires of your mind, and look what it says, to the land of Moriah. And you know what the land of Moriah is? The chosen. Take the desires of your mind to the land of the chosen, and then you will make a sacrifice. What is being said in the vernacular or the, in, the, in the language of today is take your mind to the place of the right hemisphere and there you will make the sacrifice of your thoughts and you will be set free. That's what this whole thing, that's what this whole story is about. See? Now, the word Moriah means chosen. I get, I have a, an ex, and so that when I'm talking with people who, you know, refute this stuff, I use a Christian dictionary for the, what these words mean. And that is indeed, it's an excellent dictionary. It's a Christian dictionary. And the word Moriah means chosen. So you have to take your uh, uh, desires of your mind, your son, to the place of the chosen. Now, who are the chosen? Incidentally, we get to this, I was talking to Al a minute ago. This is very, very interesting. I want to tell you something interesting. Well, the chosen people in, in, in the scriptures are the people of the tribe of Judah. Do you want to know something interesting? And as, as, as I've been going and studying and working, I found something. Do you know the word of the betrayer of, of Jesus, Jehoshua? His name was Judas. Do you know that there was no such word in the Hebrew language as Judas? Do you know that that word Judas is a Greek rendering of the word Judas? Judah. And it was the spirit that betrayed. And it's also a very interesting thing. In the, in, in the Christ or the Jesus story, okay, it was Judah, Judas, who I, whose idea it was to betray Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. In the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, it was Judah whose idea it was to betray Joseph to the Egyptians for 20 pieces of silver. Same thing. Same story. Exactly the same story. And we'll get into that as we go further down the line. How do I then come up with the idea that it is Judah which is the chosen and the land of the chosen? Go to page 115 in the, in the little Bibles and let me show you something. Okay. Numbers chapter 2. In Numbers chapter 2, this is where the camp of the various uh, tribes of Israel are to camp. If you'll notice here in Numbers chapter 2, verse 3, that Judah camps at the point of the east, at the point of the rising sun. Whenever you look north, east is on the right side. 
So the chosen are the ones of the tribe of Judah who camp at the right side. So then a Jew from which the word Judah is the root, the Jew is one who makes his dwelling place at the right side, the right hemisphere of the brain, which is done through meditation. There's, um, there's a very interesting thing. Uh, it's at the point of the rising sun, as it says there in, in Numbers, because the tribe of Judah is known as the children of light. Okay? And to, to kind of emphasize this point, I'm sure for great... The, 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 the speed of light as known, the constant speed of light is 186,400 miles per second. Okay? Now, let me just show you something interesting where you want to see who really wrote the Bible when you understand it metaphysically and not literally. If you look at Genesis, uh, Numbers chapter 2, where you are, go to verse 9. Let's number those in the camp of Judah. Okay, we have 100,000. Do you see that? Verse 9. And fourscore thousand. Fourscore thousand is four times 20. Okay? 80,000. Fourscore thousand. And 6,000 and 400. 186, 400. Oh, oh. It's coincidence? No. See? So w when you get to understand the Bible as a scientific document of the evolution of the cosmology of the universe and the evolution of the mind, it springs right out to you. And I can tell you, and I can guarantee you, you can go to every born again or every fundamentalist church in the state of New Jersey, and there will not be one person that will know that, but you do. Okay? Now, so then those who dwell at the right side, those who dwell at the point of, of the east or at the point of the rising sun, are the chosen. Okay? And if it says here, I go back now to page, um, what are we on? Page 22, Genesis chapter, uh, page 16, Genesis chapter 22. Go back there for a moment and look what it says in verse 2. Offer him as a burnt offering. That's very important that the sacrifice be a burnt offering. Because the inside of your head operates in a way exactly in unison with the cosmology or the universe. This is the burnt offering. And you can see it for yourself. You experience it every year. Let me show you how it works. Okay? This is the north. This is the south. Okay? In the north, there is the constellation Aries, which is the Lamb or the Ram of God, all right? The sun, in its trajectory, moves upward from the lowest point of the winter solstice. And in that March, or actually April period, the sun consumes the ram. The fire consumes the animal. It's the burnt offering. That happens, and summer comes to the world. All life is reborn. Everything is made new. In other words, you cannot have spring, you cannot have summer, unless the sun consumes the ram, unless there's a burnt offering. Okay, exactly the same in your body, there must be a burnt offering. In your body, okay, down at the center of your abdomen is a place called the solar plexus. Okay, it's the place of the sun. That sun must rise in energy, which it does through meditation, and impact on the pineal or pineal gland of the brain, which corresponds to Aries, which is the ram or the lamb. So the burnt offering happens when the energy of the solar plexus consumes that, which is the pineal gland of the brain, which happens by itself through meditation. So here then, what we have being said is you take your only son, you take your only son which is the joy of your life, which Isaac means laugh, which is the physical aspects of the flesh, and you take it up to Moriah, which is the place of the chosen. So you take Isaac, which is the lower part of the flesh, you meditate, you take Isaac up to that which is Moriah, which is the right hemisphere of the brain, that which is the place of the chosen, and there the burnt offering takes place when the electrical energy of the lower solar plexus touches the pineal gland and it lights up the right side and opens to you the right hemisphere of the brain and begins to give you the ability to think with brain cells at the right side. This happens for you and all you have to do in order to make it happen is discipline yourself to sit on the floor for a half hour. That's it. It doesn't cost anything. You don't join anything. You don't have to read any books. You don't have to understand it. You just have to do it. 
I do not understand how television works. I just flip a switch and it works. I do not understand how a, I don't understand how a car goes. I just get in it and turn the key and it goes. It is not required of you for you to understand all of this. It says do it. And that is the one thing that is difficult for people to do. They've got to find some school. They've got to find some, somebody waving magic wands, saying magic words. But just to sit and understand how this beauty works. And yet, how, how can you not? It's hot out. And, and summer is here. Why? Because the burnt offering took place. And, and, and at the period of time is the burnt offering. Now the sun is starting. What's happening now? The king of kings. You know when? Christ becomes the king of kings in August. What happens? Leo, the lion, king of kings, lords of lords, the sun is at its hottest, it's all over, and then starts the trajectory back down. He then comes back down, he is born of a virgin in September in Virgo, and on December 21st, the sun goes through the cross, the constellation crooks, the sun is crucified, and on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, it sits three days and three nights in the tomb of the earth, which is the winter solstice, on December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. It is every bit astronomical, every bit cosmological, every bit astrological. If the sun on December the 21st went through the constellation Taurus, the bull, instead of crooks, the cross, the story about Jesus would not have been about somebody who was crucified, but by somebody who was gored by a bull. I'm telling you the truth. It's exactly the way it was written. No other way. It's a wonderful myth of the creative power of the universe. It happens, and if you want to see it happen, I'll tell you something. I'll guarantee you something. I will guarantee you, without any shape, question, or that the sun will start to come down. The days will start to get shorter. The sun will go through the constellation Crooks on December 21st. It will go into the winter solstice, which is the darkest day of the year on December the 21st. Stick around and watch it happen. It's a prophecy. <laughs> okay. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 4, look what it says. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw this place afar off. When you raise yourself, the number three in every single case means there is going to be new life. There is going to be something magnificent happen. There is going to be something wonderful happen. Number three means new life. It means resurrection. And there you have the third day. Now, if we go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 7, we... We take this allegory into a deep revelation of physical and astrological, cosmological science. Okay? Here is Isak, the child. The mind speaks, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That's what you say when you come in. That's what people say when they come into, into meditation. Where is this thing? You know, what's supposed to happen? I don't see anything happening here. That's what's being said here. What am I supposed to do? You're just turning the lights out and making sounds in this. What's going on? I don't, I don't see anything. Because it's on the mountain. It's on the mountain. And what is Abraham's reply in verse 7? See? Where is the lamb for the offering? Verse 8, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. It's already there. Aries is there. You don't have to do anything about that. It's there. It's already provided there. The pineal gland of the brain, it's there. You don't have to do anything. It's already there. All you have to do is be willing to go up the mountain. And do you know what? Most people are not. Most people are too busy to go up the mountain. Most people, they can't leave the couch because, you know, the couch is so important. I can't, what will the couch do without holding you? <laughs> And so they can't go up the mountain, and they never see the lamb. They talk about the lamb, they read about the lamb, they sing the lamb, glory to the lamb, but they won't go to the mountain to touch the lamb. And it's in the mountain is where it is. It's no place, you'll never find it anywhere. I don't care what school you go to. I don't care the new age, the old age, I don't care if you're a fundamentalist or, or, or a vegetarian or whatever the heck you are, it's not going to change anything. You're not going to see unless you go to the mountain. Because that's where the lamb is. And that's where the sacrifice takes place. That's where the ram is. It is the pineal gland of the brain. God will provide himself a ram. Look at Genesis 22, verse 9. Abraham builds the altar. And that altar of sacrifice is within you. All of this takes place within you. I don't care if you're 100 years old. I don't care if you're 95 or 22 or 38 or 47. Once you get within yourself, everybody is the same age. 
Inside of there, everybody is the same age, and that altar is ready for you to use. And look what it says, Abraham built the altar and bound Issachar, Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the wood. Very important, the word wood. There is an ancient Chinese legend, and it says, the third human being from the east is the superintendent of wood. The third human being from the east is the superintendent of wood. What do they mean, the third human being from the east? They're talking about the third stage of consciousness. The third stage of consciousness, watch it very carefully. In Greek, of which your Bible is translated, the first stage of consciousness is earth, which is your mind, your brain. The second stage is water, which is truth, when you take that into your mind. When you rise into the third stage of consciousness, it is air, no thought. That's why the Bible says we will rise and meet Jesus in the air. It means that place where there is no thought. The fourth stage of consciousness is fire, which is the spirit, the fifth stage is the renewed mind. In every culture in the world, they have the same thing or variation of the theme, but in Chinese, the third stage of consciousness is wood. So when you rise up there to meet him in the air, according to the Chinese, it would be the point, at that point of the third stage of consciousness would be the point of wood. But it's talking about the same thing. Once you understand the truth, do you see anything here? that you see is a traditional Christian or religious concept that's kind of screwed up, you take your head, you dip it in the water, you come out of the water and rise up into the air, and you are told you have been baptized with the Spirit. It's called baptism. Baptism does not mean putting your head in water. It means raising your consciousness to the second level, which is the inner truth, that you may rise up into the third stage, which is the air, that you may be done touched by the fire, which comes down from the heavenly places of consciousness, which is fire. It has nothing to do. do see, here you, you not only have a God that's going to mess around with people's heads and get old people pregnant and then tell them to kill the kid, but you've got a God that's not going to forgive you or think you're worth a salt unless you get your head wet. Don't you think that there must be something? That's what it is. And you can explain. Do you know that most people who have been baptized have never been baptized? Because they've never done this. They don't understand it. And that's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to do. So he takes then his son Isaac. And he places him on the wood. And we understand now that that's the third stage of consciousness of the ancient East. What did they do with Jehoshua the Christ? When his sacrifice came, they placed him on the wood. It's the third stage of consciousness. Why is the third stage of consciousness? So that's where you escape from the world. When you understand the truth, you rise up into the third stage of consciousness and meditation, and you soar into nirvana, and you are out. You are gone. You are away from the... Let me show you something. Go to page real quick. That's not the page. Go to page 949. No, don't go to page 949. Go to page 296. Page 296. I want to show you something. I want to show you the con construction of the temple. Okay? This is the construction of the temple. Remember, the temple is built without human hand. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. The door to the middle chamber was in the right side. That's the right hemisphere of the brain. Of the house, they went up with winding stairs. That's the DNA. That's Kundalini. That's the circular pattern of the electrical energy that rises up the spine. They went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber, which is the holy place, and out of the middle into the third. 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 Okay. Now let's just reinforce that one last time. Go to page 949, and let me show you something at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and that's why I appeal for you people that when you can, even once in a while, come to meditation. It's so important. Watch what happens here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the Apostle Paul, whose name was Apollonius. You know, Peter, Paul, and Mary did not exist in the Bible or, or in, the, in other parts of the country. Look what he says in chapter 12, verse 2. I know a man, he's talking of himself, in Christ about 14 years ago. Watch this one now. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body. The man had an out-of-body experience. God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Do you see? And the amazing and beautiful thing is that's where you belong and you can go whenever you want. 
You don't have to become any <laughs> part of any denomination or any group. The third heaven is open to the universe, to the world, and that's where you go. In Genesis, go back to page uh, 16, and this is that part that, uh, if we look at it in physical terms, it's very sadistic. However, as we understand it now, we, we get to the point we realize, okay, this is allegory. Genesis chapter 22, verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Okay? Now, just think of this, you know, I'm not going to go back into the literalism of it, but I don't know how many of you are in this room who would actually tie your child up and lay it on wood and stand over with a knife and saying, you know, God has told me to do this. Unless you're a maniac. Maniacs do that. People that have lost their senses do it. And losing your senses and taking the Bible literally have a lot in common. Okay? He lifts the knife in Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. The word comes from God, lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. In other words, what is happening here is a statement that nature provides everything. You do not have to do anything but show up. Nothing is required of you but to come to the mountain. And, don't, and, 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 and I, I can tell you about coming to the mountain because I know how many, you know, it's a very hard thing to do because we are caught up in, 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 this, in this environment and it's very demanding on us. But how important is this, especially in this age, to come to the mountain? And yet it's so difficult because people, there's a requir if I don't do something, if I don't sing something, if I don't jump somewhere, if I don't, but there's nothing to do. You don't have to do anything. What does it say in Luke 22, verse 12? It says, the man with the pitcher of water will show you a large upper room furnished. In other words, everything is there, nothing for you to do. It's all that's required of you. I mean, what, what you're hearing here is you can change your life. Do you see the picture of the little baby dying and and trying to get its mother to stir, and what's going to happen to that little kid? And who cares about that little kid? It's just a little black kid in Rwanda. Who cares? You know, what, what we worry about is, is, is our salvation. To hell with your salvation! Touch the child. Help the child. Kiss the child. Take the child. Help the mother. Kiss the mother. Take the mother. When you go to the mountain and the ram is sacrificed within you, that pineal, that pineal gland is sacrificed within you, then the love comes pouring down that you will take the child. And when there are millions of people who will come, then they will lift the child. They will take the child. They will help the mother. They will touch the mother. And the mother will raise up and take the child into her arms. The lack of God is the lack of compassion because nobody has gone to the mountain. Instead, we've gone to church. We've gone to church and we've created a terrible evil. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 16, where we're at, it says, You have not withheld your son. That means you have entered into the meditation of no thought, and the blessing will be yours. And Abraham, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 13, lifted his eyes, and look what he saw. A ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Ares, the pineal gland. Aries is on the mountain. Aries is in the higher place. The pineal gland is in the higher place. So that's where the sacrifice comes. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is come. That's all that's been required. All that anybody's ever asked of you of God is not to become Christian or Buddhist or Methodist or anything. Simply to come and to sit and to discipline yourself and to let yourself inward, inwardly turn into Mount Moriah, the place of the chosen, and let your energy rise up and take the desires of your flesh up there to the holy place that the ram may be sacrificed by the energy from the kundalini that rises up your spine to touch the pineal gland of the brain. That's all that anybody's ever asked you to do. And the next statement is very occult, and I think you will understand it. It says, Genesis chapter 22, verse 14, And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, because that as it is said unto thee, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In the higher place, the higher realms of consciousness it shall be seen. How do I know that? Can I confirm that in any way with this book? I can. Go to page... Um, 28, Genesis chapter 32. Maybe you want to read it with me. Because it's exciting. Because it's in your head. Somewhere meshed in all of the crazy business inside of your skull is this thing that's mentioned right here. You can identify the exact spot 
Inside of your head that you have on your shoulders right now is this gland. And this gland, if you'll allow it to be touched, will open for you the kingdom of heaven. And what does it say in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30? It says that Jacob saw God face to face. And in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. And the pineal gland is a brain. It's a gland, a, a, a gland in the center of your brain. Touch it! And you'll see God face to face. And the mountain of those who is chosen at the right side. Let the sacrifice begin. I have seen God face to face. My life is preserved. You don't have to go to any church. You don't have to go anywhere. It's inside of you. Well, we come to Genesis chapter 23 and uh, page 16, I guess it is, wherever. Sarah dies. There's no longer need for Sarah. I mean, after 90 years old, she just had a kid. You know, they had to get rid of, yeah, it's the end of Sarah. No longer any need for that. But what is it? The virgin womb has conceived. It is not needed any longer. The child is born within you. The child of promise is born within you. Sarah dies at 127. Excuse me. Yeah, Sarah dies at 127. That's right. Genesis chapter 23, verse 1, 127 years. And you have here God, one, God and you, the duality, two, and seven, the divine intervention of the seven chakras. And the number 10, which means completion. 7, 9, 10. It's finished. It's completed. She did her job. Completeness. There's an occult meaning in Genesis 23. Literally, it speaks of Abraham trying to find his, a place for his wife, you know, but it's the death also of the emotions. It's gone. It's gone. You have overcome. You can bury the emotions. And finally, Abraham in Genesis chapter 23, verse 16, pe purchases a spot for Sarah as part of the allegory. And then in Genesis chapter 23, verse 4, Abraham says, I'm a stranger and a sojourner. Give me a possession of a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. These things which have finally died are no longer to be the things that you look upon. They're no longer to be the things that are important to you. Bury them out of your sight and forget them. It's just like dead people. There is no such thing. There are dead bodies. Get rid of them. Don't look for them. What are you running to cemeteries and putting flowers on things when the people are alive? The guy that sold you flowers is buried right next to the person that you're putting the flowers on. He's up again. Everybody's up again. There is no such thing as dead people, only dead bodies. What are you, what, I'm surprised we don't go to the junkyard and put a flower on our old junk car. So this just makes as much sense. You know what it is? It's a chance for somebody to make a buck. What am I going to go? You know what? When Jehoshua the Christ rose out of the grave, they come down looking for him. The caretaker at the cemetery was there. And he knew, you know what he said to the lady? Why do you seek the living among the dead? There are only dead bodies here, not dead people. He is risen. She is risen. All have risen. I'm going to show you one last little thing we're going to have some fun with uh, because we've reached Genesis 24. And in Genesis 24, as we close, is a remarkable little story. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 24, verse 2. You see it there? And Abraham said unto his eldest servant that had ruled over all he had, Put, I pray you, my, your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear. Okay? Now, what happens there is that nowadays we put our hands on the Bible, right? You solemnly swear. Ah. Or you put your hand over your heart. You solemnly swear. In those days, they put their hand on the male sexual organ. That was better than the Bible and more important than the heart. <laughs> and they put their hand there, and that's where they swore. They, they, they would do that. They would put their hand on the, the male organ. And if they, or the piano, I would assume. I, no. But they put their hand on the male organ and, and, and they would swear. Now, <clears throat> what that male organ is called 
in Latin and in the early language is testi, testis, T-E-S-T-I-S, which is the root of the word testicles, okay? And also the root of the word testify, to give witness. Now, I told you this before, <clears throat> but I thought it always has a little better impact if you see it. So for those of you who want this, just buy a dictionary and don't bother me, you know, you got to buy it. Send me a copy of that. Get a Webster's Dictionary. Would you mind, please? Would you, Vinny? And uh, real quick, because we, you know, we got, I just thought you'd like to see this. So, Because I, I, I honestly believe that some of you people think that I really make this stuff up. <laughs> just to give you a little uh, schnitzel, you know. And, uh, yes, uh, you have to. Uh, uh, just do the one. Again, they don't know what those numbers mean. Okay, a a Sarah died at 127. <coughs> Joan says 127. Watch me. We'll, we'll go over that in a minute. The, the number 10. Each number means. You ready? You want to go real quick? Okay, come on with me. Don't worry about that. Real quick. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that together. Real quick. Number one is God. Number two is you and God. Number three is new life. Number four is the fourfold nature: nature physical, spiritual, intellectual, emotional. Number five is sacrifice in the five senses of, uh, uh, what, what's the five senses? Sight, taste, touch, smell, and hearing. Number six is uh, ordinances, laws, rules, regulations. Number seven is divine intervention. Number eight is rupture. Number nine is the mind. Number 10 is completeness. Number 11, I don't know what it is. Nobody ever told me. Number 12 is perfection. They left 11 out for some reason. So that number 10 is completeness. So she dies at 127, which is very important because 7 and 2 is 9 and 1 is 10. In other words, completeness. When you have lifted yourself up, the child of promise has come to the mountaintop. The ram has been sacrificed. That's when, you see, who is, who is Jesus? Who is Jehoshua? The Christ, the Son, okay? What happens? The Son is taken up to the mountain where it consumes that which is the ram and then sits at the right hand of the Father, because after the sun consumes Aries, it moves over to the eastern sky or the right hemisphere, and then summer comes. It's all astronomical. Every bit of that Bible that you have there is a cosmological experience. It is all astronomy. It is all astrological. Okay? So number 10, then, is the number of completeness. That's why she's 127. Um, if you look in the center column here, you'll see the word testicle. Okay? And notice what it says, a male genital, usually with its enclosing structures. And see the word testes there, T-E-S-T-I-S? -E Fine. Go down to the word testify, which I have underlined. Go over to the extreme right, and you'll see that word again. You see it, testes? Witness, to make a statement based on personal knowledge or belief to bear witness. And so there's the origin of, and that's why they placed their hand on the male sexual thing because it's the testes, and there you have the origin of two words, testicle, which is the male organ, and testify. So you have a New Testament and an Old Testament, and you're going to give a testimony, you're going to testify, and the next time you go into one of those straight churches and somebody wants to testify, get up and tell them about it. <laughs> Say, hang on to yourself, and a lady should not testify. And that's why. How are you going to? Well, of course, you never know nowadays. Okay, thank you very much for sharing the time of uh, Isaac's trip to the mountain and uh, quite an experience, okay? Uh, hang on, and uh, I forget what comes on next in this tape, but for those of you who are in the neighborhood tonight, we're doing Bhagwan, the Law of Love. Good to have you.